So you might notice that there's a uh, permissions that you might need to click to accept if you'd like to be included in the recording. Um, if not, you do have to keep your video off and I'll have a reminder for that in another minute. Um, but I'm just so delighted to uh, extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you that's joining the first anatomy tutoring session. Uh, my name is Dr. Mary Piscura. I'm one of the anatomy co-founders alongside Drs. Dana Peterson and Jenna Haggerty. Um, and we'd all like to thank you for your participation in the first of its kind nationwide uh, anatomy competition. So we're all incredibly glad that you're here with us today. Um, whether you're here to uh, seek deepening of an understanding of the human body, or you're looking for guidance towards study tips, or maybe you want to gain some insight into careers into medicine and science, um, you've taken the right uh, a step in the right direction today by joining us. So uh, we want this tutoring session to be more than just a virtual classroom. It's a collaborative space where questions are encouraged. Don't be afraid to ask what or how or, uh, how or why questions. There's no such thing as a silly question here. Each is an opportunity to deepen your understanding. Uh, additionally, asking questions is a good practice. It's a foundation of science to ask questions, and we'll hope that you'll gain comfortability in that throughout these sessions. Uh, your tutors are all second year medical students who not too long ago were right where you are today. Uh, high school students that are just eager to learn and ready to jumpstart careers that will help people and expand the boundaries of knowledge. They have since all completed their undergraduate degrees and gained acceptance to medical school, and they've been leaders among their class. So all of that is to say that you're in excellent hands to be mentored by all of our fine tutors. And I also encourage you to ask questions about their journey into medical school during the Q&A portions of the session. Uh, we do ask that you save all questions for uh, the 10 minute breaks between every single presentation. I'd also like to say that remembering uh, learning is a journey, not a race. So each concept that you grasp, each new piece of knowledge that you acquire is a step forward. So with that determination, the effort, and the support of this learning community, you can conquer any of the challenges of anatomy and excel in your studies. So we're going to make the most of that opportunity. Let's embrace the wonders of the human body together and grow not only as students, but as individuals that are hungry for that knowledge and that understanding. Uh, today's agenda is going to cover introductions to anatomy, histology, and embryology, the basic concepts of which are going to be applicable throughout your anatomical studies. Uh, the Zoom session is recorded again, so that will be shared with all registrants of the anatomy, and the clips may be included on our website or in advertisements. So if you would not like to participate in any of those publications, you must turn off your video for the duration of the Zoom. Uh, we do ask that you keep muted throughout the duration of the, the Zoom, uh, excluding for those Q&A sessions. Um, once again, welcome to this exciting journey through anatomy, embryology, and histology. And with that, I'd like to introduce and turn things over to Dr. Bill Frank, who is directing our tutor team. Hello, everyone. Dr. Peterson, did you have anything to add? I just wanted to say, just like Dr. Proscura, I am so excited that you're taking time to spend the evening with us. And just really great to know that all of you have the same sort of passion that all of us as a little bit older and faculty or medical <laughs> students do. So great to see you all. Thank you. So as uh Dr. Pescura said, uh, my name is Dr. Bill Frank, and I'm going to be kind of the host for this uh, session, and I get to introduce our speakers. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first uh, presenter tonight. Uh, her name is Hannah Lufkin. Uh, Hannah graduated from Michigan State University with a degree in genomics and molecular genetics and is currently a medical student at the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in Auburn. In her free time, Hannah spends time with her family, takes her dog Izzy on walks, and listens to Taylor Swift. Hannah's favorite part of anatomy is neuroanatomy. And with that, Hannah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Okay. So I'm here to start off with the introduction to anatomy. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. This is super exciting. Um, so here are my learning objectives. Um, I know you guys all have access to those, but they're just at the beginning of all the PowerPoints to help guide you. So first, um, I'd like to talk about all the organ systems we have in our body. I think that's like a great way to start because um, anatomy is a lot of what things are, but we also need to know like what their function is in our body. So the first organ system we have is one we can see, our skin. 
Um, so that kind of protects us from the outside world and allows us to, we have like um, protects us and then allows us to like interpret different things through our neural system. Um, we also have the skeletal system, which allows me to sit upright today and supports me and um, allows muscular movement. Um, Okay, there it goes. It wasn't like progressing, sorry. Um, so then we also have our musculoskeletal, which um, connects is very well connected to our skeletal system. Um, and this allows us to move and also maintain body temperature. And then we also have our nervous system, which detects all of the things that are going on in the outside world and allows our body to react to them and um, have different reactions and allow us to live in a happy and healthy way. So then we also have the endocrine system and this is our body's way to secrete hormones and regulate different body processes. Um, that's what I'm currently working on right now in medical school. So I really like endocrine. It's a lot of fun. Keep you updated on that though. <laughs> um, we also have our cardiovascular system, which is how um, blood is delivered throughout the body. So blood carries the oxygen and nourishment and also helps with body temperature as well. And then we also have the lymphatic system, which is going to help with fluid balance in the body and then also remove any pathogens or toxins from the body. And then our respiratory system is what brings in oxygen to the system to allow the cardiovascular system to kind of put that all over the body. And then it also removes different wastes like carbon dioxide and expels that out when we breathe. And then we have the digestive system, which when we eat, we're going to chew our food and going to taste really good, but we have to be able to digest that food down to a simpler level to have our body use glucose or any sorts of nutrients that come in. And then they can go into the blood and be used for other things. But our digestive system is really what breaks that down and allows us to use the ice cream or the candy or the broccoli that we're eating. And then we also have the ur urinary system, which helps remove toxins as well. And then we have the male and female reproductive system, which produces hormones and then also gametes to allow reproduction to happen. So next we're going to talk about some like different body positions. So in anatomy, it can kind of be overwhelming because we talk about different, um, like the way the body is positioned, we have different words for it. So just to kind of start us off, I want to talk about those different positions. So the first one um, is superior and inferior. So you can see my little diagram over here. Can you guys see my um, cursor? Is that, or am I? Yeah, okay. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't like pointing at something and you guys can see it. So superior, we define up here like, as towards the head and we can also call that cranial. And the, brain, the head can also be called cranial. So that's like a way to help remember that. So towards the head or superior. And then we also have inferior, which can also be called caudal. So um, if we had a tail, because um, evolutionarily we may have head tails or different animals may have head tails, um, that is another word um, called also towards the tail and inferior is kind of what we call the opposite of superior and cranial. And then another thing to remember here is if you're looking at one of your friends, their right hand is still their right hand, even though if you're looking at them, you're like, that's my right hand, but it's on their left side. So that's just something to keep in mind is that it's kind of the opposite of one another. When you're looking at a patient or looking at your friend, their right hand is still their right hand, even though you may think it's on your left side. So just keep that in mind. It's kind of confusing, but you guys will get the hang of it. And then we also have anterior and posterior. So anterior is towards the front of the body. And then posterior or dorsal is towards the back of the body. And I kind of remember a dorsal, like if I had a dorsal fin, like a dolphin, that helps me remember it, like posterior to the body. Um, because when you see a dolphin swimming, it's on their back. I don't know, it just helps me remember it. Um, and then anterior can also be called um, ventral, so towards the front of the body. And then we have lateral and medial. So medial, um, I kind of think of like midline, so towards the middle of the body. And lateral is more out laterally towards my extremities or just more out to the side. And then we also have proximal and distal. So um, if something is more proximal, it's closer to the center of the body. Or um, if it's distal, it's more towards my fingertips, more further away from the center of the body. So then we have a couple different planes of the body. And this can be really important for how we look at the body and then also like if in imaging as well, this will come up and just kind of being able to describe the different planes of the body. 
So the sagittal plane um, divides the body into the left and right side. And you can see the sagittal plane labeled right here. So it's kind of like going through her face right here. Um, and then, oops. Um, so then in the mid sagittal plane is kind of the midline in the body. So it kind of cuts you directly in half and then you have like an equal left and right side. And then the coronal plane or the frontal plane is my favorite because I think it's the funnest to remember. So this is my coronal plane. And I remember it as if you're wearing a crown on top of your head, that that is your frontal or coronal plane. So you just picture a crown and that's your frontal or coronal plane. And that divides you into anterior and posterior segments. So if you look at this here, like the front of her body more towards the front is going to be the anterior section. And then the back side of her that we can't see through this plane is going to be the posterior. And then the transverse section divides the body um, into like a superior section and an inferior upper and lower sections. So then we can talk about some body movements. So I think the easiest one to think about first is if we were going to do a bicep curl. So if we were going to do a bicep curl like this, we can think about flexion. So I'm bringing my body in like this, or I can think about extension when I straighten out a body part. And then there's a lot of different ways you can flex and extend. I can flex my head forward or extend it back, or I can flex my knee or extend my knee. Um, I can also flex and extend my whole torso if I really wanted to. Um, so if you guys just want to take a second and think about flexing and extending, you can do that. And then next we have um abduction and adduction and these ones are really hard when you're like saying them out loud so just be really gracious to yourself and kind of say like abduction or adduction so when i think of adduction i think i'm adding something to my midline so i'm bringing things closer to my body where if i'm doing abduction i'm going to move it away um and then we also have circumduction so it's kind of just like spinning your hand in a circle down here and then also we can rotate our head back and forth. And then we also have, um, if we take like our arm, we can like rotate laterally and medially. Like what I talked about previously with lateral and medial, if I rotate my arm towards midline like this, that's gonna be medial rotation. Where if I rotate it outward, which is kind of hard to do, um, that's like lateral rotation. And then also this one's kind of fun to think about too. If you look at your hand like this, if you supinate my hands up so I can hold a bowl of soup in my hand, but if I pronate my hands facing down, so supinate, pronate. Let's see. And then if I'm going to plantar flex and dorsiflex, so this is something that we do with our feet. So dorsiflex, I point my toes up to the ceiling and plantar flex is like putting your foot on the gas pedal. And then we can inversion or eversion our ankles. So hopefully we're not doing this too often and injuring ourselves, but um, we can think of inversion as coming in towards midline and then eversion is kind of like you're stepping on the um, out, like the inside of your foot, kind of pushing your foot outward. And then you can also um, retract so pull your mandible backwards more towards your spinal cord or protract is pushing it forwards. And then you can also, to chew, you can, well, both of these are used to chew, but you can depress your mandible and elevate your mandible when eating and speaking. And then opposition is just bringing your fingers together. Okay, so next we have the body cavities. So like I talked about before, dorsal is the backside of your body. So that is your dorsal cavity containing um, the cranial and vertebral cavities. So when I talked about earlier, the um, the neuron um, aspect, like the body system, the neural as <laughs> neural anatomy of our body, um, the cranial and the vertebral um, cavities are really important for that. So the cranial cavity houses our brain, which is within our skull, which is up here. And then we also have our vertebral cavity, which contains our spinal cord, and that's within. So our spinal cord is this orange here, and then we have our bony vertebrae that contain the spinal cord. And then all of this, like I said, is in the posterior compartment because it's more towards the backside of our body. So then for our anterior or ventral body cavity, so towards the front, we're gonna have a thoracic cavity, which contains our heart and lungs. So that will be here. Um, you can see our heart would be here in this kind of teal color. And then the purple is going to be our lungs. 
And then if we're going to separate another body cavity we have is the abdominal or the pelvic cavity. And the difference between the abdominal and the um, thoracic cavity is going to be our muscular diaphragm that kind of separates the two. And then within our abdominal cavity here, we're going to have our stomach, our liver, our pancreas, our gallbladder, both of our intestines. So that's our abdominal cavity is really important for our digestive system. And then we also have a pelvic cavity down here. And there's, even though we kind of label them separately here, there's no true division between the abdominal and the pelvic cavity. So um, they can, they're very continuous with one another. Um, so the pelvic cavity contains the urinary organs, reproductive organs, and then a few digestive organs sneak their way down there as well. So one of the last things I have to cover with you guys today is homeostasis. So homeostasis is the tendency for the body to maintain its like internal conditions. So our body has like a set point where it wants to like stay, it wants to be here. It's comfortable. Think of it like watching TV on the couch and you're just very comfortable and you don't want to move. So one of those things is like our body temperature, our body for the most part likes to stay around 98.6 degrees. And we have a range that's like comfortable um, from 97 to 99 degrees. But when you have a fever, you get really uncomfortable and your body doesn't like that. Um, so there's a lot of things like body temperature, blood pressure, and nutrient level that our body tries to keep within a very constrict level to maintain its happiness. So in order to maintain that, our body has different mechanisms to keep it in check and make sure that we're not getting a fever. So if our body temperature um, is going to exceed that, we can talk about the mechanism that will do that. So if you have a negative feedback system, our body is going to try to say, okay, we have exceeded 37 degrees Celsius, which is 98.6. I'm sorry, I should have put that on there. Um, but 97 degrees or 37 degrees Celsius is also our normal body temperature. Um, but if we deviate from that, our body is going to say, hey, we need to bring that back down. So when it deviates from normal, it's trying to um, come back to its normal level. So our body senses that our temperature is elevated, say, to 102 degrees. Um, and then our nerves and cells in our brain and skin are like, this is too high. I'm feeling uncomfortable. So then the temperature regulation um, center in our brain is going to take that interpretation from the neurons throughout our body. And it's going to send a different nerve impulse to sweat glands to say, hey, let's lower our body temperature. So the sweat glands are able to bring our body temperature back down to normal. So that is our negative feedback system. And then there's also um, this thing called a positive feedback mechanism. So when your body shifts away from normal, sometimes it wants to go in that direction. Um, and this can really intensify the body changes that we're seeing. So one of the ways that this can happen, this is actually something I'm learning right now. So this is kind of fun. Um, oxytocin um, is a hormone that is secreted. Um, and then when the uh, someone is pregnant and going into labor, if the oxytocin stimulates uterine contractions to expel the baby from the uterus, um, and it pushes against the cervix, which is a part of the uterus as well, and then that impulse kind of goes back up to the brain and says, hey, we need more oxytocin to have stronger and stronger contractions until the baby is able to be birthed and pushed out of the uterus. So we increase the level of oxytocin, which is away from our normal, but in a way that's helping our body do something we need it to do. With that, I think that's all I have for you guys. I hope I didn't go too fast. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, it's, this first one always goes a little bit faster with the, uh, you know, <laughs> topical terms and such. So um, our, our agenda really is going to be more of a, a guideline that we're going to follow. But um, thank you, Hannah, so much for, for sharing all this. Um, if anyone has any questions that they want to uh, raise their hand and ask or share in the chat, again, that could be anything ranging from questions about anatomical ter terminology, anything that was covered in the lecture to asking questions about her experience as a medical student and, uh, uh, her perceptions there, um, kind of anything that you guys you guys need. So, I see one hand um, currently raised right now. I see Hillary. I see a hand. Yep. Go ahead, Hillary. You can unmute.
Hillary, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Well, I can read uh, some questions. Oh, Hillary? Uh, could you could you explain the body cavities uh, once again? Uh, oh, you're you're muted again, Hannah. Yeah. Uh. All right. Okay. Uh, it's it's fine. Okay. So. Let's go here. Let's go from current slide. So, um, do you want me to go through the whole thing again? I can totally do that. I just want to make sure I get your answer. Uh, yes, please. Okay, no problem. So, um, we have a dorsal body cavity. So, that's like posterior, the posterior part of my body. And within that posterior body cavity, there is the cranial cavity. Oh, sorry. Let me get rid of this chat here. Um, the cranial body cavity, which is up here. So that is houses the brain, um, different neurons, and then is in like in the brain is within the skull. Um, and then we have the vertebral body cavity, which is over here, and that has the spinal cord and the different um, bony vertebrae as well. So the vertebrae and the skull are protecting the um, brain and the spinal cord. Does that make sense? Okay. So then the next one, Thank you. we have uh, the anterior body cavity. So towards the front and we have the thoracic cavity, which is um, going to have your lungs and your heart. And that's separated from your abdominal cavity by your diaphragm. Um, and then in your diaphragm, you've got all sorts of digestive organs um, and accessory digestive organs that kind of just help with the process. Um, and then you have your pelvic cavity, which there really isn't a huge difference or there isn't like a distinct border between the pelvic cavity and the abdominal cavity. Um, but the pelvic cavity has more like urinary organs and reproductive organs, and then some digestive organs slip in there too. Um, but the abdominal cavity will have mostly um, digestive organs. And then the thoracic cavity is the heart and lungs. Okay. Thank you. Rob. We have a question from Annika. If you're if our normal body temperature is approximately 98.6 degrees, why do we feel hot when that's the temperature outside? That's a good question. Um, so Hannah, I might be able to help you. In yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there's anything to add. So again, Annika, that's a really awesome question. And the 98.6 is our internal core body temperature where when we get to the extremities and especially the surface of the skin covering the extremities, we're actually rerouting blood um, away from the skin and back towards the core to maintain that core body temperature at 98.6. So we feel hot at 98.6 when that's the outside or ambient temperature because now we have to route our core body blood to that surface to try and expel heat through generating sweat that we then can move into our sweat glands. And then as air moves over that water on the surface of the skin, it kind of cools the surface of the skin. And again, we can reroute some of that cooled blood back towards the core um, of our body. So I don't know if that helps or not. Maybe Hannah has something that she'd like to add. I feel like that was a really good answer, but I can try to answer any more if they have any. I was just going to add to that too, is just your body is, it has so many processes going on inside of it. And when you're producing energy and you're using energy, a lot of the byproduct is heat. And so when you're creating all this heat, all that's happening and you're maintaining that optimal temperature very optimally when the temperature, I mean, I feel great when it's about 60, 70, you know, start getting a little hot, 80 degrees. And so it becomes harder for you to 
feel good about releasing that heat and maintaining that temperature when it gets even hotter out. So imagine if that's what you're able to maintain at about 70 degrees, then when it gets really hot out, it's just harder for you to maintain it, you know, that, I guess, low. It's a good way to put it. Next question from Lillian. Can you go over the differences between inversion and eversion again? Yeah, let me go back to that slide really quick. Great question. Yes. So inversion and eversion. Um, let's think of my hand like a foot. Um, so this would be my big toe and this would be my pinky toe. Um, so my thumb is my big toe. So if I am going to evert my foot, I'm kind of going to push my big toe down and my like uh, pinky toe kind of comes up off the ground like this. So if you're kind of going to roll your ankle and your um, like your ankle or yeah, like your ankle comes more inside and then your toe kind of comes up your little toe. And then if I'm going to invert my foot, my pinky toe comes down to the ground. So I'm kind of going the opposite. I'm trying to like kind of have a leg up here, but um, my pinky toe is going down towards the ground where my big toe is going to go up towards the sky. But think of like, instead of like my wrist, I'm kind of like rotating my ankle. Does that kind of help with your question or what else can I, how else can I explain it to kind of help you? Okay, um, Hannah, uh, this this question, you are the expert. Uh, a lot of people say med school is harder than many others. Is that true? I think all, I can't speak to other professional schools. I can really only speak to medical school. Um, I think no matter what, everything's going to come with its challenges. I think like the biggest thing we face in medical school is kind of time management the content, um, you know, we learn this exact same stuff in medical school. We learn, you know, a little bit more here and there, but a lot of it's just the amount of information that's thrown at us. So I think it's difficult, but I think it's very manageable. And with, uh, you know, the first, we we kind of have a block system. The first block was a lot of adapting, but our body, as we've learned today, are experts at adapting. So I think even though it's really hard and challenging, it's really worth it and very rewarding. So I'm very excited about the path that I'm on and happy to share any other details. <laughs> Another question is positive feedback seen more as a as bad response in the human body. So I don't think go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. okay. I don't think it's always a bad thing. Like oxytocin is really important for labor. However, it's not very common. And something I should have said, negative feedback happens very often to kind of keep our body in check. Um, but positive feedback, there aren't very many positive feedback systems um, that the body has. I can think of oxytocin. I know there's a couple more, but I just can't think of them off the top of my head. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think if you're supposed to be having a negative feedback system and it becomes, say you have some sort of tumor that is creating a positive feedback system, that wouldn't be a good thing, but that's more a pathology than like a normal um, anatomical thing that we're having. And I might throw in my two cents worth if you're okay with that, Hannah, to say that negative feedback always returns that body system back to that well-defined range of values that we call homeostasis. And positive feedback always takes us away from that. So there has to be an event at some point in time where that positive feedback process is halted or that can lead to substantial injury, trauma, or even death. So in the case of the, the example that Hannah provided, the event that brings that positive feedback to closure is the actual delivery of the baby to the outside world. So I would envision or think of positive feedback as taking a body system away from homeostasis. And as long as there is an, a terminating event that then restores homeostasis, it's all good. 
But if there's no terminating event, that can lead to substantial damage in the body. Okay. Um, uh, Zarek, if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. I asked, can you go over all of the organ systems again quickly? Yes. Let's go back. Whoops. Okay. So the first one we have is the skin. And the skin is kind of what we can see. It kind of creates, like helps with our, like protecting us from the outside world. Um, without our skin, we would be exposed to all the elements. It would not be good. Helps um, with heat protection, all that stuff. We have our skeletal system. So that's all of our bones within our body. It allows me to sit up straight and it works very closely with our musculoskeletal system, which allows our body to move, but we need our bones to kind of hold us up. And then our muscles kind of pull on our bones to allow us to flex, extend and do all the movements we need to do. And then we have our nervous system, which takes in everything we have from the outside world and detects things on the inside and allows our body to respond. So say I'm like, my hand is over a hot stove and I'm like, oh, that's hot. I didn't know. My body is sensing that from the outside and using our skeletal system to move my hand away. And then we have our endocrine system. So that's kind of like oxytocin, so like hormones. Um, it kind of allows our hormones to be produced and then kind of regulates different body processes that we have. And our cardiovascular system delivers oxygen and nutrients and then allows body temperature to be regulated as well. And then we have the lymphatic system, which removes different toxins from the blood and then also is important for fluid balance. And then our respiratory system um, removes carbon dioxide from the body and then also delivers oxygen and it uses the cardiovascular system and these like blood vessels there are the um, veins and arteries to deliver blood to different organs so that we can use that oxygen to move our body and then we have our digestive system so if you're gonna go home and eat a hamburger tonight you've got to chew that up and digest it so that we can use the different um the different uh, micronutrients that are within that hamburger to fuel our body, to fuel our muscles, to fuel our brains, to learn all this fun anatomy. And then we have the urinary system, which will remove um, water or different um, waste that we have. And then the male and female reproductive system just produce sex hormones and then gametes and allow for reproduction to occur. One thing that I'll just add to all of that um, is that uh, you'll have individual lectures also for these uh, systems that you have. So this is more of just to introduce you to the very basic functions that they have. So if you still have further questions about those, um, we're more than willing to answer them at any time, but you'll also get some extra dedicated time to learn more about what each of these systems entails. Um, Dana asks, can we go over the body movements again? Uh, she missed a few. There's a lot of them and they're kind of, there can, it can be kind of confusing because um, like, like, like I said, with flexion and a lot of these can happen in different, with different limbs or different areas. So it can be kind of confusing. So we have, if we're going to flex our biceps, we'll bring it like this and extend, I'm straightened out. So flexing is when I'm going to shorten a muscle and extending, well, this muscle in particular, I should say flexing, and then I'm extending out my arm like this. But like I said, you can flex your knee and you can extend your knee. You can flex your head forward and extend your head back. And then you can also flex and extend your entire trunk if you or your upper body, if you'd like, kind of like in this picture. And then um, this one is the hardest for me. And sometimes I really have to think about it still. Um, so adduction is I'm adding it to my midline. So I'm bringing it closer this way, like towards my, because this would be his midline here, or bring it closer to midline. And then abduction, I'm moving away from midline. So I'm kind of like bringing my arm up like this. And then circumduction is just when I bring my hand in a circle, like my arm in a circle like this. Kind of like, I think like in gym class when your kids, they do like the little arm circles, kind of like that. And then we have like rotation of the head. So you can shake your head. And then the lateral and medial rotation can be kind of confusing too. So again, if we picture his midline right here, he, if you medially rotate, you're moving 
you're like rotating towards midline. But if you're laterally rotating, you're moving your body or you're moving the extremity away from, you're rotating it away from midline, if that makes sense. So you're kind of rotating a circle towards midline and then away from midline, if that makes sense. And then pronation and supination um, happens in the arm. So if I'm supinated, my hand is up like this and I can kind of hold a bowl of soup if I want. And that's how I think about it. And then if I pronate, I rotate my radius over my ulna, which you guys will get into all that later. But the motion is like this. And then supination is like this. Hannah, can I just interject? There's a question mm -hmm. about pronation of the foot. And um, Dr. Peterson answered it a bit in the text, but maybe she could jump on and, and tell what the difference between pronation of the forearm and hand versus the foot is. Sorry, Dr. Peterson, for putting you on the spot. <laughs> totally okay. So I used to be, I used to teach little uh little kids how to swim. And I think you all might remember when you first learned to float with your face down, they said, we're going to, we're going to float on our bellies and that's prone position. So if you're face down, you are in the prone position. If you're lying on your back, staring up at the ceiling at night, you're in the supine position. So then we consider the surfaces of our hands and our feet kind of in the same way. So the palmar surface of our hands, when we rotate those downward, as if we're floating in the swimming pool, that's the prone position, and rotating them upwards, like Hannah said, holding a, a bowl of soup, that's the supine position. So maybe that, if you imagine or visualize that, maybe that would be helpful. I like that. I'd never heard that before. That's a really good way to think about it. Um, so then we also have our dorsi and plantar flexion. So I think of plantar flexion, like planting my foot on the gas pedal. Um, so I'm kind of pushing my foot down like this or dorsi flexion, my toes are pointing up towards the sky. So plant my foot on the ground with plantar flexion or dorsi flexion, my feet are going up to the sky. And then you can also think about dorsi flexion, like this being like the back of your foot, like dorsi flexion, like the dorsal part of your body as well. And then inversion, eversion, like we said, if my thumb is my big toe and then my pinky finger is my little toe, um, if I'm everting, my big toe is going towards the ground and this is coming off the ground, but I'm rolling that on my ankle. And then inversion is the, the foot is coming towards midline. So then my big toe is going up towards the sky and my little toe is going on the ground. And then you can protract your jaw. So kind of like if you um like push your jaw out or retract your jaw and then you can also elevate and depress your jaw as well kind of with all these things happen with like chewing and talking and then opposition is bringing your fingers together like this all right well i think we are right at the junction to transition to our next presenter hannah Thank you very much for uh, providing all that excellent uh, information tonight, as, as well as your insight into medical school. And uh, so I appreciate everything you did. Thank you for your time this evening. And with that, we're I'm going to let you off the hook. And I am going to introduce our next presenter, and that is Gabriel Costa. So Gabe is in his second year at Drexel University College of Medicine at West Reading. He graduated from the University of Chicago where he studied political philosophy. After a number of years as a carpenter in rural Vermont, he decided to pursue medicine and obtain a master's in medical science from the University of Vermont. When they are not studying or working, he and his wife, Sarah, are with their children. Currently, their five-year-old daughter wants to be a ballerina trash picker-upper, and their eight-year-old son wants to be a subsistent farmer guitar maker. Gabe, Gabe loves the three-dimensional nature of anatomy and is in awe of the embryological development. 
And so with that, I am going to give the floor to Gabe Costa. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Um, let's try to share my screen here and let me know if this works out just fine. Um, start broadcast. All right. Uh, so I will be presenting this evening on histology um, and we will cover epithelial and glands and connective tissue proper. So um, histology is kind of the observation of microscopic anatomy through the use of specially prepared uh, tissue specimens. And when we look at the kinds of tissue that are out there, we think of kind of four different sorts. And so where Hannah took us on a very big overview picture, I'm gonna take us down to the microscopic level. Uh, so there's nervous tissue, there's muscle tissue, and then we'll focus on epithelial tissue. Um, and we'll look at a couple forms of connective tissue, connective tissue proper, and then um, blood, which is a fluid uh, connective tissue. So these are the learning objectives, I think that are poor out, out there for all of you guys um, online. Um, so we'll just go over the, um, what epithelium is, um, and we'll talk a little bit about glands and the basement membrane that sits underneath epithelium. So epithelium consists of one or more layers of cells that line the interior and exterior surfaces of the body. So you think of like your, your skin or what kind of goes inside of the gut tube. Um, and it has diverse functions depending on where it is in the body. Um, so for example, epithelial can secrete hormones from glands and absorbs nutrients in the gastrointestinal tract. The naming of individual cells can vary depending on the location of the tissue, but for our purposes, the general principles of the structure and function are shared. Um, so we'll talk, just a quick note on orientation when we're looking at these, um, we're gonna look at some slides in a, couple, in a minute or so here. When we're talking about height, we're talking about the space from the lumen or the opening of the space, or in the case of skin, the kind of the outside world. Um, and then the width of the cell is then the space between it and its neighbor. So can you see my cursor on the screen here? Yep, okay. Um, and um, so the superficial surface or the, is gonna be the surface up here. The basement membrane is this purplish line underneath and we'll try to see what we can in the slides coming up. Um, so when we talk about up, it's up to the surface, down, down to the basement. Um, so we buy epithelial tissue based on the shape of the cell in the uppermost layer. And there are three basic cell shapes that we encounter. Um, so we have simple squamous, um, or we have squamous epithelial tissue here with these wide cells um, that are wider than they are tall. We have cuboidal, which um, as the word implies cube, um, have this kind of squarish or cube-like shape. The nuclei of the cell, which is what this dark brown blob is in the middle, sit more or less in the center. And then we have columnar, which also like the name says, are these columns that sit next to each other. The, in general, the um, nuclei of columnar cells tend to be in the bottom third-ish of these cells. Um, and then when we look at various kinds of epithelial tissue, we think of it as simple, which means there's a single layer. So here's simple squamous, simple cuboidal, um, simple columnar, and then stratified, meaning there are layers and layers of epithelial cells on top of each other before you get down to the basement membrane, which again is this kind of purplish line here. So we have stratified squamous, um, which we can see here. And these are defined, we name them by the type of cell that is on the surface. So here it's stratified squamous because it's squamous cells at the surface. Um, stratified cuboidal, cuboidals at the surface, stratified columnar, columnar um, cells at the surface. There are two types in here. Um, Pseudo stratified is sort of, it looks like it's stratified and it's harder to see in this image. We'll get a nice, um, slide presentation or a, um, a nice 
uh, image from uh, the microscopy in a moment on this, where it is, it appears as though it's stacked on top of each other, but in fact, every single cell makes it down to the basement membrane. So therefore the pseudo component and then transitional epithelium we'll talk about in a couple of slides. So let's start by talking about the basement membrane. Um, it's this layer that binds epithelium to the underlying connective tissue. Um, and it's kind of gel-like, it anchors the epithelial cells um, at their basement and is this meshwork um, that allows uh, some kinds of chemicals to make it their way through and others not for some substances. Um, and it is kind of, it sits between um, the blood supply of that's in the connective tissue um, and whereas the epithelial tissue itself has no blood supply. So there's no inside of it. So there, there aren't any um, capillaries running inside of epithelial tissue itself. And that's one of the defining features of it. Um, and it's physical barrier. So when we think of something within kind of a tumor associated it for that those cells have to make their way through but they can spread regionally or around where it is and then maybe eventually make it into the bloodstream or lymphatic system and spread to other areas of the body. Um, and it's comprised of these molecules that can trap water like glycoproteins and it has this um, special type of scapulin um, collagen that will be covered um, a little bit in here and then I think a little bit more in future. So here are some examples of simple epithelium. Um, so remember that this is a single layer. Um, and the, the cartoon here gives us a nice sense of where you can see that they match up. So this line of simple cuboidal cells where they kind of look like little cubes with the um, nuclei in the center of them more or less see them lining around here where my cursor is, same goes around here. The squamous epithelium that they're pointing out here is a little harder to see in this slide. It's a little easier over here, which is in the lung. Um, and you can see that the nuclei in these cells kind of pushes out on the edges of the cells, which are, again, they're sort of flat-ish they are wider than they are tall, um, and the nuclei bulge up a little bit out of the surface. Um, you can see the so simple squamous here is the same thing as being called type one pneumocytes, but again, that sort of varies on tissue on what, um, so cells in various tissues will have individual names, but here we're talking about simple squamous and it is the same thing. Um, same goes here, so type two pneumocytes as labeled are simple cuboidal cells. Um, so you can see cuboidal here. I think this is a little harder to see over here. So it's, this is kind of a nicer view of the simple squamous. And then finally we have simple columnar. And again, the cartoon gives us a clearer view of what those look like, but it can give us a reference point to then look on the slide and say, well, these are cells that line up nicely um, in columns. If we look along the kind of the more superficial side, you'll see that it stains lighter, it's a little lighter pink. Um, whereas down towards the basement membrane, it stains darker and that darker staining there is where the nuclei are. And you can, in some cases, it's a little clearer to see that there's kind of a blob, um, darker blob, which comprises the nucleus. Um, and I just wanna make a side note here. You'll see over Here's one, there's another one right here. And these are goblet cells. And we'll refer back to these when we talk about glands in a couple of slides, um, but just take a note of that as we're looking at it right now. And then finally with um, epithelial cells in general, there can be microstructures on the surface. And so you can kind of see if there's this darker line as you work your way along um, that is uh, the microvilli. So they're little projections at the end of the cells and they're specialized. Um, depending on where in the body you find these tissues. Um, so let's work our way in now. We're going to take a quick look at stratified. Um, so these are multiple layers of cells, um, as we talked about before. And here we can see stratified squamous epithelium. So again, these cells 
Here is the lumen just for, to get us oriented. So this is up. Here is the basement membrane. This is down. So if we look up at the close to the surface, we'll see these cells that are um, wider than they are tall. So, and um, again, here in the cartoon, you can see those a little bit more clearly and then reference back up um, into the slide. And one of the things that you'll find is that in stratified epithelium, the shape of the cells as you get deeper can change. You might find some that look more like cuboidal, but remember that we name them based on what we find at the surface. Um, here is an example of stratified cuboidal epithelium. Um, and these are from ducts, um, glandular ducts. I think this is in a sweat gland. And again, using the cartoon as kind of a basis, we can see that there are these multiple layers, in this case, two of cuboidal cells. So if we take our reference up here and we can kind of see these cells stacked on top of each other. Here again, they're stacked on top of each other, multiple layers, and that's our, our um, stratified cuboidal. And then there are not that many places in the body that you find um, stratified columnar. Here is an example from the urethra. Um, and these are tough to see, um, but you're seeing stacked columnar cells, one on top of the other um, there. Let's take a quick look now at those pseudostratified. So we talked about these where they look as though they're stacked. So if you look on this line here, it appears to be layers of cells stacked on top of each other. If we were to zoom in a bit more, you could see that all of those cells that make it all the way up to the surface and have those little projections on the um, on the surface. This is from the, um, let me see. This one should be, I believe, the, um, in the trachea. Um, but they all make it down to the basement membrane, which here we get a nicer view of than we have elsewhere. It's this kind of light pink line. Um, and then finally, we have our, um, let's see, this is our transitional epithelium. And the large difference in shape that you see in transitional epithelium from the basement membrane to the surface, you can often come there might be an abrupt shift in that those shapes, which you can really see right here at the surface layer. Um, and you find these in, um, particularly in the bladder, um, and they change shape depending on whether the bladder is full or so or relaxed, empty. So when it's stretched out, you can think of it kind of that they start to elongate and thin out. When they come together, they'll kind of bunch up. And actually these cells at the surface here are often referred to as balloon shells because they take on this kind of roundy shape at the surface, but they're also a form of epithelial tissue. And the last part of our epithelial discussion will cover, um, we'll just do a quick comparison of a couple kinds of glands. There are lots of different ways to talk about glands. You can talk about them based on what they secrete, um, where they are, what kinds of, what their products are um, and how they secrete those things. And today we're gonna focus on two basic systems. So exocrine glands and endocrine glands. And exocrine glands are comprised of these epithelial cells and they secrete their products either into a duct um, or directly onto a surface of the body and the duct will then carry things to the surface. And that can be an interior surface. Um, so something that's inside the, say the gut um, or it can be an exterior surface like your sweat glands on your skin that push things out directly. Um, you can have unicellular glands which are made up of little cells. So if you'll recall a couple slides ago, I referenced or I showed you a goblet cell Here's another similar cell type, a mucus cell that pushes things out directly onto the surface. Um, or you can have these multicellular glands, um, which empty into ducts, which then empty out. Um, and um, so the image at the left is these simple epithelial sweat glands. And this one over here on the right um, 
are these branched structures, um, the tubular glands in the small intestine, in the duodenum. Um, and you get a nice view over here on the left. You can see kind of here's one looking at it as though you cut a pipe straight across. And here's one that's cutting it kind of lengthwise a little bit more so you can see a little bit more of the run. So this is kind of a recap, but the, they have the secretory portion and a duct, and it gets directly to the surface for exocrine glands and for endocrine glands, those dispense their products into the bloodstream or extracellular fluid. Um, and they include things like the hormones that Hannah talked about going through the endocrine system, um, like insulin from the pancreas associated, we think about often with uh, diabetes or testosterone that's produced in the testes and then circulates in the blood. Um, so those go into the fluid um, and go to a surface. So that covers our, you know, our epithelial section. Now we're going to talk about the um, connective tissue. Um, so we'll go over connective tissue proper, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about the structure and function of connective tissue. We'll talk about the three main fiber types, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of the basic features that you'll find collagenous connective tissues. Here we'll talk about loose areolar, dense regular, and dense irregular. And then blood um, comprises fluid connective tissue, and we'll go over that in the last one. So, so here is our basic overview of connective tissue proper. Um, it's defined as widely spaced cells embedded in an extracellular matrix. Um, and connective tissue proper supports and protects other tissues and structured by, kind of as the name implies, holding them together. It's composed of transient cells, resonant cells, and the extracellular matrix, um, which contains ground substance and various fibers. And unlike the epithelial cells we talked about earlier, connective tissue is highly vascularized, meaning that there are abundant blood vessels running through it, lots of capillaries that allow for um, exchange of gas and nutrients um, in, this, in this tissue type. Um, permanent cells inside of connective tissue include um, adipocytes and uh, fibroblasts or fibrocytes. You can see both. Um, versions. So adipocytes are fat cells. They contain and they store and um, synthesize fats and secrete them when needed. Um, where fibrocytes are build, kind of produce the um, collagenous tissue or a few of the other, the fibers that we find inside of the extracellular matrix. Um, and the fibers of the connective tissue can really be divided into three categories. So we have collagen, um, reticular, and elastic. And a nice way to think about these, um, something Dr. Peterson uh, taught me, was sort of like, you want to think about it sort of as like, um, like you're laying concrete or um, rebar. Um, so think of like the extracellular matrix as similar to someone laying down a new sidewalk and the metal rods, the rebar, are the fibers and the wet concrete is the ground substance that's around those. Um, so the collagen fibers we'll look at in a moment are the rebar. You'll find these reticular fibers that are more like a mesh and then elastic fibers that are more like slinkies. Um, and we're... The collagen allows you to provide like the, um, the structure like the rebar does. Um, those uh, elastic fibers can allow things to be stretched. Um, so collagen resists that, elastic fibers allow that stretch. Um, and for our purposes, we're only gonna focus on three types of collagen. So type one is the most common. It can be found pretty much uh, in bones and tendons and ligaments. And type two can be found in cartilage and type four um, sits along the basement membrane of the epithelium and helps divide it from the uh, connective tissue. So here are a couple examples of the loose 
connective tissue. Um, we see adipose on the left here. Um, so these cells appear to be empty. Um, and the nucleus of the cell, this dark um, thing at the edge of each of these. Um, the process that we use to preserve tissues uses alcohols, and this tends to remove the fats or the stored lipids inside of each of these cells. So once we actually see them on a slide, they appear hollow. Um, and then you can also see they're labeled here, there's a capillary, so a little blood vessel. Um, so again, unlike the epithelial tissue we saw earlier, these have abundant vascular uh, structures in them, abundant um, blood vessels. On the right um, is loose or areolar connective tissue. Um, and this we find throughout the body. It surrounds our blood and lymphatic vessels. It's from nerves. It can be found in the upper regions of the skin or um, upper the dermis and deep layers of the skin. And it's far and away the most abundant kind of connective tissue in the body. And all three fiber types um, are usually found within these along with fibroblasts and ground substance. So we can see this pale kind of streaks that are sort of almost like watercolor in the background here are the collagen fibers. These fibers that run across a sort of darker pinkish purple are reticular fibers. Um, and we can see the cells suspended inside of this. Um, and then what we didn't see in that last image was reticular fibers. And this tend to require a specialized stain. Um, so this uses silver stain. Um, to get these, and that's what these very dark lines are here. This is uh, the reticular fibers that you find in connective tissue. And they're very fine, thin ones. They just don't tend to show up in the other stains that we use. Um, dense connective tissue comes in two kinds. So we have our regular and irregular. And I like this one because it's, it's kind of easy to remember regular looks pretty uniform. It's kind of, it all travels in the same direction. Um, these are collagen fibers. They all are in parallel to one another. Um, we can see the fibroblasts or the fiber making cells kind of tucked in between. Um, and there's this nice wavy pattern. Irregular, um, instead of all running parallel to each other, um, it's found in deeper regions of the skin um, and kind of the capsules that encase some organs. It's most, again, mostly type one collagen and they're not in parallel, but they have lots of different orientations. So here we have um, an epithelial cell layer, the basement membrane underneath, and then this collagen going in lots and lots of different directions on the nice, or the kind of like wavy fibers all traveling together. Um, and this is, this kind of the dense stuff is what you would find in things like ligaments and tendons. Um, and there's a note that's kind of a heads up for what you guys are coming up to in, a, I think, a month or so um, when you talk about muscle, which is that dense regular connective tissue looks very, very similar on these stains to smooth muscle. And I just wanted to give you a couple of ways to start thinking about how to distinguish the two of them if you come up against these two compared to each other. So... Um, here, again, we have that sort of wavy pattern of the dense connective tissue. Um, and here, you'll see that the, the smooth muscle tends to be, does not tend to have that wavy pattern to it um, as much. So it tends to, as like in the name, it's smoother. Um, and then generally on staining, there will be, it will just be a little bit blotchier in dense connective tissue than it is um, where you get this nice, more uniform staining for smooth muscle. Uh, I hope that that helps when that time comes for you guys and you can refer back to this or similar slides. Um, and our final bit here is a specialized form. So blood is a form of connective tissue. It's a variety of cell types and they're suspended in a fluid called cytoplasm. Um, by volume, peripheral blood is about 55% plasma, 45% red blood cells, and less than 1% white blood cells and platelets. And when we use numbers like that, those are not locked in stone. They're kind of gives you a sense that there's a tends to be more plasma than there is red blood cells, but not by a huge amount. And then 
by volume in somebody who is B, there should be very many white blood cells by, you know, so it's going to be a very small amount. So just think of that less about, you know, specifically about 55 and 45 and one and more a lot, not quite as much and very, very little by volume. Um, what we're going to start off here with is that they all come from, a, you know, the blood cells that we have all come from a common origin. Um, mostly in produced inside of the marrow. Um, so you have this stem cell that can divide into a couple of different lines, um, the myeloid stem cell, which eventually can yield platelets, um, which comprise little tiny um, pieces. You can see some labeled here, um, which is just another word for red blood cells. So these are red blood cells here. You can see that um, kind of donut or inner tube type shape, but they don't, there's no actual hole in the middle. It's just that it, it has this wider rim around a very thin center. So fills, neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes. Um, and we'll go over those in a second. And then um, the other cell line is this lymphoid cell line, which we can find goes to these small lymphocytes. And I don't think you guys are going to be asked to distinguish between T and B lymphocytes by site. I'm not sure that I could do that at this stage by any stretch of the imagination. So um, let's um, go over then the kinds of things that you'll find. And again, remember for our purposes that we're not going by exact numbers. These are kind of our approximations. There should be, you know, so we'll start with the most common, which is you'll see a lot of neutrophils. And if you recall neutrophils, um, come off of this shared line with erythrocytes, um, basophils, eosinophils, and monocytes. Um, and they have these kind of multi-lobe nuclei. So what we're seeing here is this lighter staining and they, you can make their way in and kind of see that they, their nuclei are sort of connected by these little thin lines here, here, and they sort of blobs. And roughly approximately about two thirds of um, what you'll see in um, the white blood cells and in peripheral blood. The lymphocytes here are kind of the next most common. Um, and they have this large, mostly spherical nucleus with, um, this is one example. There's a, let's see, you can see another here. We kind of get that halo of the cytoplasm of the cell. So the nucleus kind of has the center there. And then monocytes. Um, there, you know, so if there are a lot of neutrophils, a fair number of lymphocytes, there are not all that many monocytes um, by volume or number. Um, and they tend to have a horseshoe or kidney shaped nucleus um, that has this kind of bend to it. Eosinophils um, are pretty rare. They're also multi lobe, but staining. Um, so these bilobe nucleus with um, or multi-lobe nucleus with bright red and orange dots in the dots. And finally, basophils, which rarely see, um, and they have these dark green. In this image, you can see the nuclei. Most of the times it's really hard. It gives you a better sense of what you may encounter if you do which is that it tends to be sort of washed out by, it's hard to tell what's nucleus, what's granules in the cell. Um, and I think that wraps things up on my end. I know that a lot of information in a short period of time, um, which to uh, Hannah's point, or at least the experience of med school, but if you have questions and just take time, I think it can be very helpful. So there are some references. Okay. Gabe, before you uh, pop off of the, uh, go back to the last slide. Can you go over the mnemonic at the top? Oh, yes. Sorry. Never let monkeys eat bananas. Um, is things in, not just to remember the, um, these cells, but also in descending order of how frequently you'll find them. Never, neutrophils, lymphocytes, let, monkeys, eosinophils, bananas, which are the rarest of all, 
your basophils. And uh, mnemonics like that are gold when you're trying to remember large volume. So. so while all of you are thinking about questions that you want to ask Gabe, um, I just wanted, because we're recording this, um, I thought it might be helpful. Um, just a slight, I think, um, uh, I think Gabe just misspoke right on the very first slide. And everybody does this because you get a little nervous the first time you're, you're doing this. Just wanted to make sure all of you understood that when we talk about um, blood, that in fact, that fluid is called blood plasma. So cytoplasma is what we find as the fluid inside cells, but now we're talking about a specialized type of tissue. So the cells within blood are the red blood cells, the white blood cells, then platelets are little fragments of cells, and then what they float in, that fluid is called plasma. So now it's on the recording, everybody understands, and we can just move on to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, question from William. Can you repeat the lecture objectives of this part so I know what to remember? The, or both of them? Um, he did not say, but I'm assuming no, the okay. second section. But I'm going to go through on both. On our, um, both. our website under the lecture objectives. Uh, panel in case you guys lose any of those, but that's exactly where these come from. So if you happen to to miss them at any point, um, they just come right from the lecture objectives on our website. So Lillian that asks, can, can you go over the types of collagen fibers again? Yeah, and I think If I'm not mistaken, there's going to be a more specific lecture with more collagen focus. Is that right, Dr. Peterson? Dr. Peterson? Um, but I think that I can give uh, another quick, let's see, where did I put that? Um, in our tissue section here. Um, so for our purposes, we are really going to look at just um, the three types. So type one is most common, and we can find it in bones, in tendons, and in ligaments. Type two can be found in cartilage. And type four sits in the basement membrane is one of the thing, places that we associate with it. And it has that more like gel-ish like structure to it and I admit to any input on on that last one um from dr peterson or dr piscora or dr frank but that's uh those are the three types we will will focus on there are many many more and i think that it just these are the ones that we're emphasizing and maybe gabe just because you know we we know the difference between a ligament and a tendon and cartilage, but maybe you can just go over that, or I'm happy to if you'd like me to. I need to. Okay. So um, when we talk about that dense, regular connective tissue, everyone, that forms, as Gabe said, it forms tendons and ligaments. Now, maybe before this lecture, you didn't understand this, but here's, here's what you got to know. So tendons connect muscle to bone and ligaments connect bone to bone. And they're made of the tissue that you're seeing on the left-hand side of the slide. Now, many people that I know that are very, very smart think that tendons and ligaments are comprised of cartilage, but that is not correct. So now you are smart, smarter than a lot of people I know. Tendons and ligaments are comprised of dense, regular connective tissue. Cartilage, most often we have different types of cartilage and we're going to get to that, but you might not think of cartilage as being smooth and glass-like and a perfect place where you can find cartilage 
as at the ends of long bones, like I'm showing you right now, the ends of two bones where my fists are, and that smooth cartilaginous surface is what allows bones to move within a joint capsule. So that's a really important distinction, and I'm really glad that um, the question came up in the chat. Okay, any other questions? If no one else um, has one, then I might just ask, um, just because we're looking at two different schools here, um, how might Gabe describe his uh, his feelings about medical school, his journey, anything that you would have told your, you know, 16-year-old self, I guess, along your journey uh, <laughs> that you would have appreciated at this point? I took a very long and winding path to med school, which perhaps can help in the sense that you don't always know. I certainly didn't at age 16 what I wanted to do um, and found my way here um, by trying lots of things and lots of mistakes and learning a lot. Um, and you kind of over time get a better sense of the things that you do or do not like and you want to spend your days doing whether there's a place where you can really match the thing that you're doing in the course of your day and the other aspects of your life um, and whether they, they meet well together. And I have found that this is a place where I really like the kinds of problems that people deal with in medicine. Um, I like the constant changing knowledge that's going on, all of the research that's going on, people who are trying to push boundaries a little bit forward, try to discover something a little bit new. And combined with a deep care and concern for people who are having in need. Um, and medicine in many ways is unique in that way. I think from an educational standpoint, I would echo what Hannah said, which is, you know, took a lot of other courses there I find when I try to just what school is like is it's it is the challenge is the volume of information. So it's much about learning how you learn and trying to be full in how you learn and be willing to relearn how to learn <laughs> um, is about any particular piece of information. Um, so that's what I would add to that. And you can get there from lots of different routes. I had some tough grades coming up through all of this and had a story to tell and they took me. So <laughs> you don't have to be perfect. Thank you. I think that's a really good sentiment. Thank you, Kate. And I don't see any more questions for Gabe. So if it's okay, we'll move on to our third presenter. Excellent work, Gabe, as with Hannah. So uh, Kate has a, has a, uh, she's got big shoes to fill here. So with that, I'm going to introduce Kate Long LeJoy. Kate graduated from John Hopkins University with a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering and subsequently earned a master's degree from Georgetown University in biophysics and physiology. She now attends Drexel University College of Medicine. When not studying, Kate loves to travel the world with her husband, Mike, always returning home to her rambunctious pup, Lily. Kate believes that learning anatomy is like discovering a roadmap of all the fascinating structures that enable us to live and do what we love. And so with that, Kate, uh, please share with us what you love, which will be general terminology, gametogenesis, fertilization, and implantation. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen here.
Uh oh, okay. Sorry about this. It's, I think Zoom took a, an opportunity to update in the last day, <laughs> but hopefully this solves the problem. Okay, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Great, thank you. Okay, so today we'll be focusing on the last portion of our lecture here on general terminology, gametogenesis, fertilization and implantation. Okay, so the lecture objectives, just so we know what to focus on, are to distinguish the difference between embryonic fetal age and gestational age, define the term teratogen, identify several examples and discuss the effects of each, describe the process of spermatogenesis, explain the process of oogenesis, and describe the pre-implantation development of the embryo from zygote to blastocyst. So we got our work cut out for us. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the difference between embryonic or fetal age and gestational age. So embryonic or fetal age is the age beginning at fertilization when the sperm meets the egg, whereas gestational age is calculated from the first day of the last menstrual period. So, for those of you who don't know, and we will be going over this in a few slides, um, there are about 14 days or two weeks between the first day of the last menstrual period and ovulation when the egg is made available for fertilization. So the way I remember this um, is embryonic and fetal age. In the name, you kind of have an embryo or a fetus. So I think of this as the age from the embryo's perspective. They don't care what happened before they were fertilized, they didn't exist. Once they're fertilized, that's where their, um, their process begins. So I think of embryonic fetal age from the egg's perspective. Gestational age, I think about from the, um, like the perspective of the reproductive organs. So before you can ovulate and implant an egg in the uterus, you have to prepare the environment to make it hospitable for that egg. Um, that process includes the two weeks before fertilization, and again, is calculated from the first day of the last menstrual period. So you can see in the developmental chart that there are three stages listed. Um, the last is the fetal stage. In the middle, you have the embryonic stage. And then there is a little um, gamete stage um, in the developmental stage, uh, which include the first two, well, the first two weeks of conceptual age the last two weeks of gestational age. That can get a little confusing, but just spend a little time with this chart and um, it'll be a little bit clearer. I also wanted to point out the dark pink or red um, bars on the graph corresponding to different organ systems. The darker portion indicates that this is a, a vital time for development. So while the entire 40 weeks or 38 weeks is extremely important, um, the dark pink indicates the most important time for those organs or organ systems to develop. So to review the menstrual cycle, we said that the uterine lining is shed in the first one to four days. That's approximately how long a menstrual period takes from when you would first notice signs of a menstrual period to when a menstrual period is over. Um, ovulation occurs on day 14, and this is triggered by an LH or luteinizing hormone surge. And we will talk about that a little bit more in a moment. The ovum survives for 12 to 24 hours following ovulation. So it's a fairly short window after ovulation that you have to fertilize the ovum with a sperm. Um, an ovum is just a more technically correct term for, for the egg. So that's the female gamete. Before we delve into the menstrual cycle and the process of generating those eggs, um, let's talk a little bit about teratogens. So I want to define a teratogen first which is any substance that interferes with the normal development and causes or increases the risk of causing congenital disabilities following exposure. So here's a little chart again, showing you that the dark blue is the time of greatest vulnerability, um, which you can imagine would correspond to the time of greatest development um, for each of these different organ systems. 
Okay, so I just want you to take a moment and think of any examples. Think of anything that you have heard um, you're not supposed to do while pregnant or any exposures that you think would not be good for a developing fetus. Okay, we're gonna go through a few of these together. So the first teratogen I would like to talk about is alcohol. I'm sure you've heard that you're not supposed to drink um, during pregnancy, and this is the primary reason. The critical period of development is the first month of gestation, where functional deficits can result from exposure through the development of the fetus. The mechanism of action, or MOA, as you'll often see it abbreviated, is that ethanol or alcohol can pass from the maternal to the fetal blood via the umbilical cord. Ethanol induces apoptotic neurodegeneration. Now, apoptotic is an interesting term as well. It basically means programmed cell death. So it is cell death that is physiologically supposed to happen, um, as opposed to like a pathogen or a pathogenic process causing cell death, um, which would release all those internal cell contents and kind of wreck habit. And apoptotic cell death is very controlled and kind of contained. Um, I kind of think of it like a, a building being demolished because they're very careful to make sure the building collapses in one controlled area. Um, whereas if you have a building that's not structurally sound or is attacked, um, the damage can be unreliable and can often cause damage to neighboring buildings or cells. So the pathology of alcohol um, and its effect on the fetus is twofold. You can have fetal alcohol syndrome, which is a set of physical and mental birth defects resulting from alcohol exposure during pregnancy. And you can see to the image on the right, um, these include a few different um, facial con considerations or characteristics like a thin upper lip, a smooth philtrum, which is the little crease between your nose and your mouth, um, a slightly upturned nose, um, a flat nasal bridge, uh, among others. And you can also have, with fetal alcohol syndrome, a variety of mental birth defects that just make it more challenging um, for that individual as life progresses. You can also have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which describes a range of effects stemming from fetal alcohol exposure. This is just a more varied um, assortment of effects. The fetal alcohol syndrome is more specific in its uh, descriptions, whereas fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, as the name implies, is covering more of a spectrum of um, effects. I'm sure that, well, actually, I'm not sure how old you were when this happened. It feels like it was yesterday, but it was pre-pandemic, so that's definitely not true. But the Zika virus caused some scare um, several years ago, especially when uh, people were traveling and if people who might not know they were pregnant were traveling, it was especially concerning because that critical period was during the first trimester. So you could potentially contract Zika virus, not know you were pregnant, and then by the time you find out you're pregnant and that maybe you shouldn't be traveling, you already have the virus. So the mechanism of action is that it's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, the pathology is not completely understood, but it's understood at least that the Zika virus envelope protein causes a decrease in brain stem cells leading to microcephaly. And as I'm sure you're familiar, uh, stem cells are just the most basic um, like origin of, of cells. So you can have brain stem cells that would grow into all the other different types of cells for the brain. Um, you could have gametes, which are stem cells for the development of a fetus. There's just a variety of different stem cells. You can have skin stem cells. Basically anything that has cells originates in some form as that stem cell. And then microcephaly, as the picture indicates, is just a small or reduced size of brain. Obviously that makes sense. If you have a decrease in number of stem cells, you cannot develop all the necessary brain cells to form a fully functional and formed brain. Thalidomide is an interesting case, particularly because it is a teratogenic um, medication, but it was initially used among other things to treat morning sickness. So you, so you can imagine the vast ramifications this had, you're using it on a population of people um, for something that is you know, restricted to that population where they really should be avoiding it for um, the purpose of development of the fetus. 
So the critical develop or the critical period of development in this case is the limb morphogenesis period, which are at weeks four to five. The mechanism of action is that it inhibits angiogenesis, which inhibits fibroblastic growth factor or FGF, which stimulates limb growth. So if you kind of track that back, FGF stimulates limb growth, you don't have SGF, you cannot stimulate the limb growth. Again, it's not fully understood, but as you can see to the picture on the right, um, the limb pathologies are a little bit interesting. Um, they're not simply truncated at like the elbow, for example, you actually do have some development of the hands and feet or the distal features as we were talking about earlier. Um, but what you're really missing is kind of in between the distal feature and the attachment at the core. Um, the pathology, as I just said, are limb formations with fecomelia or distal appendages attached closer to the body or amelia, um, which is just the lack of limb. Um, internal organ malformations that are associated with thalidomide are heart defects and duodenal stenosis. And the duodenum is part of your digestive tract. If you can imagine you have a stenosis or a narrowing anywhere along the digestive tract, you're going to have some ramifications down the line. Okay, so we're gonna transition to uh, gamete production and to um, reproductive organs and oogenesis, spermatogenesis, all that good stuff. So I want to you to focus first on the bottom half of this graph on uh, spermatogenesis. And there are a few things I want you to take note of. The first is that the gametes are arrested, mitotically arrested before birth. So if you see the dotted line here for birth, the gametes are mitotically arrested. Um, you can contrast this to oocyte development where you have a meiotic arrest. Uh, the difference between meiosis and mitosis, just to, in simple terms, are that mitosis is um, cellular reproduction where you're going to end up with a genetically identical daughter cell from that parent cell with the same um, amount of genet genetic material. Whereas the meiotic arrest or the meiotic process, um, you get a daughter cell from a parent cell that has a reduced or half the amount of, in this case, half the amount of genetic material. And you're going to get different uh, assortments or different combinations of genetic material um, in each daughter cell. So just keep in mind that we've got mitotic arrest here and meiotic arrest here all before birth. So for spermatogenesis, the mayor players within the testes are the seminiferous tubules, which contain the developing germ cells, the Sertoli cells or support cells, which provide nutrients for germ cells, and the Leydig cells. These produce testosterone, which maintains spermatogenesis and just helps it progress from this first stage of mitosis here, all the way through the spermatid and sperm cell differentiation. So the sperm travels, it takes a, a pretty convoluted route um, through the male uh, reproductive system. And at each stage, it accumulates something. So it might be um, motility, or it might be um, a portion of the seminal fluid. But at, we, at each stage, it's becoming closer to that final product that you need to uh, fertilize an egg. So it starts with the testes with the production and storage of immature sperm. Then it travels to the epididymis where the sperm complete mature, where continue to mature. Travels through the ductus deferens, which is a luminal tube. Again, these everything listed here is part of that tube or that process to go through. Um, the ejaculatory duct is the structure that joins the ductus deferens and the seminal vesicle, which is a gland in the picture to the right it's this little orange guy here, and we'll go through its function in just a moment. From the ejaculatory duct, it travels through the prostate gland, which produces a component of seminal fluid, and then it is produced through the urethra and out into the world. Um, okay, spermatogenesis um, continued. The components of the seminal fluid are, seminal fluid is, not just the sperm, it's the sperm and all of the proteins and, and nutrients that um, the sperm are contained in. So as the name suggests, it's the fluid that the sperm travel in. The seminal vesicle 
produces the most major components of seminal fluid. They produce fructose, which provides energy, and ascorbic acid, which helps, um, it's an alkaline fluid, so it's not it's not acidic, it's basic, that protects the sperm from the acidic environment of the vagina. Again, you need those sperm to, to survive through any harsh environments, uh, one of which is the vagina, to eventually make it to those ovulated ovums. The prostate gland produces the second most um, abundant component of seminal fluid, and it produces phosphate, lysozymes, spermine, citrate, fibrolysin and other chemicals. And this concoction or mixture of chemicals prevents sperm from coagulating. Again, you want them to be mobile, you want them to be modal, and you want them to be able to reach their final destination. The testes and epididymis, as well as the bulbal urethral gland do contribute to the seminal fluid, but in a much smaller um, volume. Okay, so we're familiar with this photo. We're, we're Circling back around, we've talked about the mitotic arrest in um, male germ cells that continue to grow after birth and through puberty. Fetal development is, is very interesting in, in many regards, but one of the most interesting aspects of it is that we're going to come back to this meiotic arrest. The fact that it happens before birth means that you have all of your eggs before you are even born. So that is really interesting. You, you are ready to go. They're not developed, but they are the, the stem cells, as we talked about, that um, you need to, to ovulate each month after puberty um, in order to conceive. So if you think about it that way, that you actually have all your eggs before you're even born. And then from that stockpile, they'll go in, on to, to mature in certain ways. So the process of egg development is called oogenesis. Um, and it is linked to the menstrual cycle very, very deeply. So the follicular phase is the first phase, as we talked about, day zero to 14. This is supported primarily by follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. So in response to FSH, about 10 primordial follicles or young follicles will mature to primary follicles and then to secondary follicles. And there are a lot of characteristics between these um, stages that you will learn eventually if you decide to pursue this, but everything, you know, is happens for a very specific reason. And um, the characteristics of each follicle stage contributes to the development of the ovum. So the first secondary follicum, follicle becomes the dominant uh, secondary follicle, simply by using more FSH. It's greedy. It takes more FSH than the others. And that inhibits the, uh, the growth of the other follicles. So you do want to ovulate only one egg, but you start out with 10. And the way that you end up with one is this greedy follicle, this dominant secondary follicle uses more FSH than the others. Hey, Kate, before you go on, can, can you up at the top of that diagram with your cursor? Could you just help um, all the students that are listening or that are going to watch the recording kind of understand that the follicle is the shell of cells. And so maybe pointing out the follicle versus the oocyte, the egg cell inside. I think that might be helpful for them. Yes, absolutely. I'm so sorry. I forgot I could forget. You could see my cursor here. So that's, yes. So you've got the ovum here. Um, a follicle is formed around it. And the follicle is what primarily determines primordial, primary, and secondary follicles to a certain extent. And it's indicated by this red material here. So the dominant secondary follicle becomes a tertiary follicle. And ideally you just have one of these tertiary follicles because it has suppressed the growth of all the others. So once you have this tertiary follicle, the next stage at day 14 is ovulation. And this is triggered by a luteinizing hormone surge, um, which leads the follicle to swell and burst and eject that ovum into the peritoneal cavity. So the follicle over here, the environment that the ovum has been um, kind of sitting in is, rem it remains behind and it ejects the ovum here uh, into the peritoneal cavity. When I was learning this or before I learned this, I actually thought that the egg kind of like followed a tube similar to the sperm into the, um, from the 
from the ovary into the fallopian tube, but it's a little bit cooler than that. You have these fimbria or fingers that kind of reach out into the peritoneal cavity after the ovum has been ejected and kind of brings it into the fallopian tube. So it's, um, it's less of a, a solid, solid tube and more of like many hands grasping for the ovum and bringing it into the fallopian tube. The follicle that's left behind in the ovary becomes the corpus, corpus luteum. And we will talk a little bit about that, but I believe that's covered more later if you do need to know anything more in depth about that. Uh, we're gonna focus on the ovum today. So once the fimbria at the end of the fallopian tube have brought that ovum in, we have reached the luteal phase, which is day 15 to 28. This phase of the menstrual cycle is supported by progesterone. Um, at this stage, the ovum has not been fertilized. So we're just focusing on the menstrual cycle as if, um, as if conception has not occurred. Uh, so the ruptured follicle becomes the corpus luteum, which produces progesterone and inhibin. Inhibin inhibits FSH, and we're gonna go back here, FSH um, promotes the follicular phase. So you want the luteal phase to last long enough to build up this endometrial lining so that if, um, if fertilization did occur, the endometrial lining would be uh, a supportive environment with which to implant that egg. The degeneration of the corpus, corpus luteum leads to the decrease in inhibin. This is uh, this leads to an increase in FSH, which leads to the follicular phase. So the decrease in inhibin, it's you're decreasing an inhibitory substance. So it's actually called disinhibition um, because you're removing kind of like the brake pad. Um, and if you remove the brake, you're going to go faster. Or in, in this case, increase your FSH production. Again, this, this is a little bit complicated, but if you focus on this chart over here, it brings everything together quite nicely. One thing I did wanna mention was that the LH surge um, is brought about primarily uh, by its relationship to estrogen. And I just wanted to connect this back to our very first lecture about um, feedback. Once you, so the estrogen, as you can see, is growing here. Um, you can see the yellow line is increasing. And the blue line, the luteinizing hormone, is maintained fairly low. And that is because estrogen primarily inhibits LS, or LH until it gets to a certain threshold. So it's initially a negative feedback to the LH. Once it hits a positive threshold, um, it actually causes the LH surge. So it has the opposite effect or a positive, like a feed forward effect. And again, Kate, before you you move on, can you just help them understand that each of these different horizontal rows on the diagram is really kind of focusing on different events, some of which are taking place in entirely different organs. And I think that would be, if you highlight that, I think that will make more sense to them. Yes, absolutely. So as we focused up here on the top with the ovum and the follicle, this is the ovarian cycle. Um, so this is the the events that take place in the ovary. You've got body temperature here. Oh, did I lose my cursor? There it is. You've got body temperature here, which is pretty self-explanatory, um, but I, you can actually measure to a certain extent um, your ovulation based on your basal body temperature. So that's kind of a cool metric to be aware of. Um, you have the anterior pituitary hormones here. The anterior pituitary um, is located in, like your brain. So it is not a reproductive organ and it is responsible for much more than just um, the menstrual cycle and the production and maturation of ovum. Um, it is kind of like the second in command of um, the hormones your body produces. The ovarian hormones are being released by the ovary. So kind of connected over here to the ovarian cycle. Those are occurring in the same place. And then the uterine cycle is the life cycle of the uterus lining. So you can see these red squiggly lines are blood supply. Um, you can see the surface kind of degrading here. That's because you're losing um, endometrial lining and that is through the menstrual period. Uh, then you can start regrowing the endometrial lining. The blood vessels continue to grow, continue to supply nutrients and oxygen to that endometrial lining. 
um, until you start that process all over again. Okay, so fertilization, we're gonna bring our knowledge of um, the male and the female gametes together into fertilization. So before we go into the process too deeply, I wanna take a moment to explore the uh, microanatomy of these two structures. So the human sperm or the spermatozoa is composed of a tail or flagellum. Um, an axonym refers to kind of the, the, the microstructure within the flagellum, but we that's beyond the scope of this class, I believe. Um, then you have the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the, of the cell, what supplies the energy. Um, and that is housed in the mid piece. Then you have the head of the sperm. So you've got three pieces, tail, mid piece, and head, and each of them have their own function um, and their own characteristics. The head is composed of an acrosome or kind of like a, a cap, a protective cap. It's kind of like um, the helmet of a knight um, outfit, I guess. Outfit seems like the wrong word, but you know what I'm saying. Um, then you have the nucleus, which contains all the DNA material that you want to eventually combine with the ovum. And then you have the centriole, which I might need some help on that. Not, not important for this scope of the class, I guess. All right, for the human egg or the ovum, you have the nucleus, again, corresponding to the male sperm nucleus here that contains the DNA or the genetic material for the egg. You have the first polar body, which is the result of cell division. That used to be an ovum as well. It's, it's been degraded to a, well, it's been left behind kind of to become a first polar body. And if you go back to that uh, image that I shared a few slides ago, with the male or the female development on top and the male on the bottom, you can see where the first uh, and second polar bodies are coming from. Then you have the zona pellucida or a jelly coat surrounded by a corona radiata or a crown of cells. Um, that's how I remember it. You've got corona crowns kind of right in the name. And cytoplasm as we discussed before is the, the internal uh, contents of the cell that are not the nucleus and the other small organelles. <laughs> Okay, so fertilization events, I'm trying to go in order here. So fertilization takes place in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Um, that is just a really important tidbit of information to know. You'll be asked it many times throughout the course of your life, perhaps not in trivia, but definitely uh, you know, in the course of your medical or an anatomical studies. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, sperm penetrates the ovum corona radiata. So going back here. Uh, sperm is going to first contact the corona radiata because that's on the outside. You have what is called an acrosomal reaction. So proteolytic enzymes released from sp the sperm acrosome begin to dissolve the ovum zona pellucida in order to allow the sperm to enter. So that let's just take that in for a moment. You've got proteolytic. Um, if we break it down, you've got proteo or protein. Lytic is um, like destructive or uh, so you're destroying the protein and enzymes are the proteolytic component that are doing that. Um, they're released from the sperm acrosome, which was that helmet cap that I talked about. And they begin to dissolve the zona pellucida in order to allow the sperm to enter. So they've penetrated the corona radiata, the acrosome comes into contact with the zona pellucida, and you have what is called the acrosomal reaction. So the membrane membranes of the sperm and the ovum fuse at this stage and the cytoplasmic contents of the sperm enter the ovum. Contact between the sperm head and the ovum membrane lead to an increase in cytoplasmic calcium, which triggers the second meiotic division and the cortical reaction, which hardens the zona pellucida and prevents polyspermy. So at this stage, your contents, your cytoplasmic contents have fused. You have the male uh, genetic material close to the female genetic material, but there is something else we need to worry about, and that is that you don't want every sperm that comes into contact with that ovum to be able to contribute its genetic material. So we need to shut that down. Once one sperm enters, we need to lock down the, the boundary or the barrier to any other entering sperm. And that's kind of where the cortical reaction comes into play. So it hardens the zona pellucida and it prevents polyspermy or multiple sperm fertilization. 
The second meiotic division is completed at this stage. The chromosomes of the ovum and the sperm decondense and become the female and male pronucleus. So the chromosomes are very well organized most of the time in these tight coils, um, which are not easily accessible to other, to the um, male counterpart or to the female car counterpart to complete meiosis. So uh, you need them to decondense. De Basically, if you wanna zip up, let's see. I'm trying to think of a good um, analogy here, but but in order to have anything gain access to the entire genetic material or genetic contents, you do need them to relax and kind of decondense so that it can gain access to the to the um, pronucleus of the other gamete. So the pronuclei fuse, and at this point, they have formed a zygote. Okay, so pre-implantation development, we have fertilized the egg. The sperm has joined with the egg and their pronuclei have now formed a zygote. Um, following fertilization, the zygote repeatedly divides as it travels down the length of the fallopian tube. So remember, we were fertilizing the ampulla, which is right here. It's kind of like the widest part of the fallopian tube near the fimbrae. And it is going to start to divide. So you have fusion of egg and sperm, pronuclei, We've got our zygote because remember, once the sperm meets the egg, it does take a while to travel down the fallopian tube. And all the while you have these events occurring. Once the zygote is formed, you divide again to a two cell, four cell, eight cell, again, traveling down the fallopian tube as this happens until you reach um, what is called a marula, which is just a solid cluster of cells. The reason it's called the marula is because it kind of looks like a mulberry. Um, and I think it's a, a Latin term for mulberry led us to naming it amarula. So that's kind of how I remember that. Um, once the once fluid penetrates the marula, you can call uh, the cells a blastocyst um, and they consist of two cell populations at this point. So the marula has just one type of cell. So we call it, we say it has one cell population, but as soon as fluid penetrates the marula, it is now a blastocyst with two cell populations. And those populations are the inner cell mass, which you can see right here, called the embryoblast, at the outer cell mass here called the trophoblast. Uh, implantation occurs about four days after fertilization. So if fertilization occurs down here in the ampulla, it takes about four days to travel down and then implant here in the side of the um, uterus. And that covers everything, I think. So I, I know there's a lot of information. It's like drinking from a fire hose, but just spend some time with the material and you can ask any questions and you'll, you'll get a good understanding of it. Okay, well, uh, great job, Kate. Um, do we have any questions for Kate? We have a few minutes here for question and, and answer. Okay, let Dr. Pescura or Dr. Peterson answer that question. So I'm gonna ask, um, is, it, is it Riley? Riley, can you turn on your microphone if you don't mind? You don't have to put your camera on if you don't want to, but just give me a sense of really what you're trying to ask. And that maybe I can try and answer it. Uh, so are we basing uh, what we're talking about here? I'm like, I heard uh, Mrs. Um, let me check real quick. Uh, where is it? Uh, the first lady who spoke. Uh, not sure her name. Anna. But um, I heard her talking about like, how like the tailbone comes from evolution. And I was wondering where we stood on that, like as a whole of this group, like are we coming from a more evolutionist standpoint or a more um, like non-biased standpoint without like really pushing a certain bias? I guess what I'm gonna say, Riley, and maybe this is getting at your question, maybe not. We're 
going to take sort of the standardized traditional um, perspective of the formation of all of these different cells and uh, the processes that um, we associate with, in Kate's case, human development. So there's an evolutionary aspect, of course, based on what we understand from the paleontology paleontological record, but we're not trying to influence anyone or sway anyone around any given um, single philosophical perspective. So you have uh, your own unique way of viewing some of this. We can recognize that and we appreciate that. Does that help? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am, that does. Uh, I was just wondering, like, are we going to be base? Uh, you answered my question, but I was just to break it down a little bit better, uh, I was just wondering if we were going to be like basing this off like a certain viewpoint the entire time being like we evolved from this, this or this, or we were created by God through Adam and yeah. I think what I'm going to tell you is that, again, a little bit more standardized or traditional approach based on the evidence that we have at this point in time. And we'll try not to bring evolution or anything else into it, but keep our lectures and our learning objectives and therefore our assessment questions really focused on evidence-based science and medicine. Can you define standardized? So I'm gonna say our standardized view is what is typically presented um, in curriculums associated with uh, undergraduate and uh, graduate school programs here in the United States. All right, thank you. I think all of um, that too is pretty much what we touched on today is usually um, kind of all that we would even highlight about um, kind of the, the development in respect to um, anything outside of the human body. So um, I think in terms of what we would be testing to any of the things that, um, you know, where any uh, beliefs might come into play, I'd say are not something that we're trying to test you on, um, on, on the exam. So if we're talking about the development of the human embryo, leaving it at that, then that would be our, our focus for you to, for you, uh, you to know for today. Okay. Uh question from Habiba. Uh, she had joined a little bit late, but wanted to know if uh, they will be tested on the knowledge of anatomy, histology, and embryology, or will they get to pick one of the three to be competing in? So I think it's a very good question. It is a really good question. Um, Dr. Priscura, are you okay if I, I take this one? Yeah, so let me make sure everybody understands that um, for the local competition that's happening on Saturday, February the 24th, so we've got time to get you prepared for that, you'll actually uh, participate in an online virtual competition, and it will consist of 150 multiple choice questions. So 100 multiple choice questions will be text-based questions, and approximately 30 will be centered on anatomy, 30 or so on histology, and 40 of those questions will pertain to the embryology learning objectives. And we're, we're, we're not gonna go outside the boundaries of those learning objectives. If you stay focused on those, whether you're concept mapping or outlining, use those to sort of direct your study efforts for the competition. That's the 100 sort of text-based multiple choice questions. The remaining 50, 25 are going to be image-based cadaveric questions. So a cadaver is an, uh, an anatomical donor and 25 will be histology image-based questions. But they both, both sets of those image-based questions will still be multiple choice questions. That, does that help everybody? Hold on. So you said, um, so hold on, were there any questions that weren't, that were not multiple choice? No. So they're all multiple choice. Woo -hoo! Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, William. Exactly. Um, Asher, 
asked if the slides will be put on the website or are they only in the videos? So I believe we we're just going to do the videos, just at least for this um, inaugural year of competition, uh, while we sort out our, our slide decks and everything. But uh, we do really appreciate your feedback. And if that's something that um, you find would be really beneficial, that's good for us to know, um, you know, moving forward, because um, really all this is to kind of serve you guys and whatever your learning needs. So that that's good to know if that's something you feel that you need, and then we'll, we'll work towards that. Um, and then I think we just missed a question that was a little up, and I want to make sure we didn't miss it, was um, Lillian had a question, um, I believe for Kate about, uh, what, uh, what she studied for undergrad. She's a senior looking to study, uh, undergrad and, uh, wondering how a path with engineering went, um, in high interest in engineering research, but I've heard it can be a, a much harder major to pursue. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. So I, um, I knew I wanted to pursue engineering as a major in my undergrad, I was pretty certain about that. Um, I really enjoy math and I like, you know, learning how things work, which is part of the reason I really like anatomy because you're learning how everything is put together and how it works together. Um, it is certainly a difficult major. I don't know if it's more difficult than any other major. It's just I, the only one I have experience with, obviously. Um, but I will say that if you pursue something you're really interested in and you're really passionate about, regardless of how hard it is, um, it is the right course of action because if you're you know if you're working 80 percent you know power on something you hate like would you rather be doing that or like giving 120 percent to something you really care about um engineering research sounds very like interesting i had um a bit of a complex time explaining why engineering or why my engineering background uh, prepared me well for medical school. And that's not to say it didn't, it certainly did. Um, but I did have to kind of do some like, you know, self-reflection and figure out why I love engineering and why I thought that did translate well into medicine. So just being aware of uh, what you appreciate, what you like doing, as well as your long-term goals. Um, and just making sure that you're, you know, you're following what you're interested in, but at the same time, keeping in mind, um, you know, your, your ultimate path. And, and obviously that path can change many times. So just keep it in the, in the very back of your mind, but primarily I would encourage you to just pursue what you're interested in because regardless of how hard it is, it's worth it. Yeah. Have one last question from Annika for the three presenters. Has anyone here done a combined BSMD program and what did you think about it and would you recommend doing it? So I did not, so I, I can't help in this one. I'm sorry. Gabe shaking his head no. I have not. Um, I had a student that was on that track uh, that had joined our research lab when I was uh, completing my PhD. And um, so this is just from an outsider's perspective, uh, take this with a grain of salt, is that it seemed very structured and it seemed like she was very involved in a lot of things um, throughout her time in her bachelor's because she had that structure from that program. So I think, um, you know, it looks like a great program from the one that Marshall University that I had seen, but I'm sure there are, uh, you know, program to program specifics that, um, you know, I couldn't tell you details about, but uh, seems like a very, you know, uh, high paced course <laughs> to where you could get a lot done. And I'll just really quickly, I used to teach at an institution that offered a BSND program. And um, just two things that you should consider. Typically, you're selected for those programs coming right out of high school. So you have to be really competitive as a high school student. And then the day after you graduate, you start your undergraduate BS part of the degree. And that means you got no summers off. You pretty much go straight through. So if you have any interest in traveling or, sh you know, doing some volunteer work, um, shadowing physicians, it, it makes it more difficult. And then finally, when you are in medical school, and by the time you get to where you're actually rotating through different kinds of internships within the hospital, you're still fairly young. And sometimes that maturity that you gain with life experiences helps you better relate to patients. It's not saying that you can't do that when you're younger. It just sometimes is more of a challenge. So I think all things to consider. 
I'd say don't be afraid of a gap year between undergrad and grad school. Um, having now um, helped with interview applications and stuff at my current institution, um, I actually find that our students that took a year or two or three or more off um, between undergrad and grad school tend to be extremely competitive. Uh, you know, really the the standout leaders amongst the group um, from getting that experience. So don't be afraid of it. That being said, again, I've had people that are also leaders from right out of undergrad. So um, hopefully that helps. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I'd just really like to thank everybody for being here for our, our inaugural competition and for our uh, first tutoring session. And big thank you to uh, Hannah, Gabe, and Kate for giving such amazing presentations for this first time. So um, everybody, you know, round of applause for them and, and round of applause for you all for spending your Sunday evening to be here. So I just wanted to say that. I would just like to say as a precursor, uh, October 22nd, uh, we will be looking at the anatomy of the skeletal system, also the histology of cartilage and bone, and in embryology, we will be looking at gastrulation. So much to look forward to. Thank you all for coming. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.